this is the third lecture um, on this NPTEL course on tribology of materials. In the first two lectures, I have covered the fundamentals of uh, tribology and its impact on the nation's economy as well as industry. In the second lecture, I have covered that how to characterize the tribological surfaces, right. You know that in terms of the surface roughness, RA values and RZ values and what are the different parameters on which on the basis of which that one can distinguish the various engineering surfaces, what is the rationale of using different parameters. And in this particular lecture, I will be covering mostly on the friction laws and mechanisms, okay. So, let me start with this, uh, let me start with this particular slide where I have shown very clearly the two major type of friction, one is the sliding friction and one is a rolling friction. So, what is the sliding friction? Sliding friction is that you have a one solid here and this is a nominally flat solid. So, this particular uh, rectangular solid is being slided against the nominally flat surfaces and once you pull it that is the direction of motion, the frictional force this is not F, this is F is equal to mu w would be acting on the opposite side. So, this is the V that is the sliding direction of motion. So, again this would be V, this is the V and their frictional force will be F is equal to mu w that will be acting here. Now, what you see from the sliding friction that F is proportional to w and the coefficient proportionality, coefficient of proportionality is called as coefficient of friction that is mu. So, F is equal to mu w. So, rolling friction here again you apply the load w and your motion is uh, this, uh, this ball would be rolling not sliding in contact with the flat surfaces and there will be frictional, uh, frictional force that will be acting. So, rolling friction is much less. So, if you say sliding friction is mu s, mu s is much much larger than the rolling friction. Typically, rolling friction is fairly less compared to that of the sliding friction. Okay. Now, if you this particular slide if you see, I have shown that different materials, classes of materials. Now, if you know that there are three different classes of materials are there and these three classes of materials, those who are from non-materials background, you know that there are three classes of materials and these classes of materials are as follows. So, these materials are essentially metals, ceramics and polymers. So, these are the three different classes of materials, metals, ceramics and polymers. So, all these three classes of materials are widely used in the tribological applications. But this metal, ceramics and polymers, they have, they, they are distinguishes, distinguished from each other by different properties. So, metals typically have metallic bonding. So, this bonding wise, these metals are different bonding compared to ceramics. So, ceramics are essentially covalent and ionic bonding and polymers along the chain they have a van der Waals bond and across the chain and across the chain they have a covalent bonds and along the chain they have a van der Waals bond. So, these metal ceramics and polymers they have they are really distinguished from each other by in terms of bonding. Now, if you look at this other parameters like hardness wise this if this is the hardness. So, hardness wise metals are actually less than ceramics and ceramics is much greater than polymers. So, ceramics by far the harder material. Now, if you in terms of this elastic modulus metals uh, ceramics is greater than metals and metals is much greater than polymers. So, elastic modulus wise ceramics by far has much higher elastic modulus, 
hardness wise also ceramics are much higher in a hardness than metals and polymers. So, this is these are the some of the reasons that why ceramics have attracted wider attention in the tribology community simply because they have much better material properties than other counterparts that is metals and polymers. Now, the friction and wear does not depend only on hardness or elastic modulus that also depends on the chemistry of the surfaces like chemical composition of the surfaces. So, therefore, hardness or elastic modulus cannot be considered as the sole parameters for determining that what would be the friction and wear of a particular matting couple. So, now coming back to this particular slide where I have shown that polymers like plastic like acetal, polyamide, nylon, high density polyethylene, PTFE, polytetrafluoroethylene. If you see that these particular materials they have a fairly low coefficient of friction and mostly it is less than 0.3. If you go to some of the elastomers like natural or synthetic rubber or silicon rubber, it can mostly it is greater than 0.3. If you go to solid lubricants like MOS2, molysulfide, moly molydisulfide, graphite, fullerenes, C60 and all, it is less than 0.1 mostly. And on the top of it, if you use lubricants together with solid lubricants, then even the friction coefficient would be much less, it would be less than even 0.1 also, less than even 0 0.01 or something. Okay. So, what you see that depending on the different composition of the polymers, although they are elastic modulus properties may be comparable, in some cases the coefficient of friction they vary, but overall the coefficient of friction for polymers are certainly lower. Now, if you look at the materials like metals like aluminum, cobalt, copper and all, the metals typically in the self mated condition, self mated means that self mated means the identical metal versus identical metal. So, two, mated, two matting solids when they are identical in terms of composition and grades and so on, then we call it self mated. On mild steel means for example, aluminum against mild steel, this is the 0 0.5 to 0 0.6. I mentioned in the very beginning or even in the first lecture that friction coefficient of stainless steel does not mean much unless you mention friction coefficient of stainless steel against what. So, unless one mentions the what is the matting solid, one cannot say what is the friction coefficient. So, from this particular table two things that emerge that for a same material coefficient of friction certainly varies when you change the other matting solids. For example, let us take the example of aluminum. In the self mated conditions aluminum coefficient of friction is 0 0.8 to 1.2, but on mild steel aluminum coefficient of friction is 0 0.5 to 0 0.6. Let us take the example of titanium, I am telling why aluminum, why titanium because aluminum and titanium these are the alloys, they are mostly used in various engineering applications from aerospace, defense and so on and so forth. Titanium self metal titanium is 0 0.5 to 0 0.6 whereas, on mild steel it can be little lower it can go to 0.4. So, overall if you compare the slide that I have shown the earlier slide, the table I have shown in the earlier slide and the slide I am showing with this present table, it is very clear to you that metals typically have more frictional coefficient or a coefficient of friction is much more compared to polymers. Polymers you can go even go down to even 0.1 or less than 0.1, whereas the metals is largely above 0.5. If you see for the COF of the metals, it is mostly greater than 0.5. Some of the other things alloys, so again those who are not coming from the metallurgy background, alloys essentially means that mixture of two metals or mixture of a metal 
with another metal or a non metal. For example, steel it is an alloy of iron, Fe and carbon. Okay. So, T i 6 L 4 V another materials which is widely used in engineering applications. It is an alloy of titanium, aluminum and vanadium. So, alloy does not always mean that it is a mixture of two alloys. Alloy can be a metal and can be non metal. In this particular case non metal is carbon. So, all these alloying elements essentially serve certain purposes. For example, in some of the metallic alloys these alloying elements increase the strength of the materials. Okay. So, and this strength essentially increase is particularly due to the mechanism called solid solution strengthening. What is solid solution strengthening? Solid solution strengthening means solid solution strengthening means that carbon goes into solid solution in the iron lattice and therefore, when it goes to solid solution iron lattice it essentially restricts the dislocation motion and this dislocation motion essentially gives rise to ductility in the metal. The moment the dislocation motion is restricted in any material the strength of that particular material will go up or will increase. So, that is the underlying mechanism as how solid solution strengthening increases the strength of any metal. Now, let me go back to this alloys like you have a leaded brass, copper, zinc, lead or grey cast iron where coefficient of friction is 0.821 for the self method, but on mild steel it is less 0 0.3, 0 0.5. Cobalt based alloys, nickel based alloys they are also very useful for various engineering applications. Here in the self method conditions they are this, uh, uh, this coefficient of friction is 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 or 0 0.6 to 0 0.9. Okay. Now, other things that I have mentioned that there are three type of materials right. One is metals, one is ceramics, one is polymers. So, you have already seen in last two slides how the ceramics and po uh, sorry polymers and metals their coefficient of friction in the self method or against some mild steel varies. In this particular slide what you are seeing it is the unlubricated self mated ceramic couples what is the coefficient of kinetic friction. In case of alumina it is 0 0.3 to 0 0.6, in case of titanium carbide it is 0 0.3, it is diamond it is 0 0.1. So, diamond as you know it is one of the polymorph of carbon. So, diamond and graphite is there, tungsten carbide it is 0 0.3. So, roughly it is again less or equal to 0 0.3 that is a typical equation of friction of most of the ceramic materials. Okay. So, again if you rank in terms of the coefficient of friction I think polymers is much less than ceramic and ceramic is less than metals or in other words metals coefficient of friction is much higher than ceramics than polymers. Right. So, it is it is definitely does not have any correlation with the elastic modulus because if you go by elastic modulus, elastic modulus, elastic modulus wise ceramic is higher than metal higher than polymer. So, it does not follow the same trend as elastic modulus. So, although elastic modulus influences the contact pressure and other things as we have seen in the last slide, last lecture, but it does not have any direct correlation with that of the coefficient of friction. Okay. So, here I am introducing the two different terms one is called static and one is called kinetic friction. What is static friction like you know if you start any sliding experiments initially the friction force goes very high up and then it goes down then it goes to steady state friction. So, this is your steady state friction, friction and what is called kinetic frictional force F k and this is your called static frictional force F s. Now, typically the static frictional force is limited to 10 to 100 milliseconds and here relative motion is initiated and 
this kinetic friction that goes down. So, typically kinetic friction is less than that of the static friction. Okay. Now, a typical frictional force, the frictional plot, now I will show you at least 3 to 4 different frictional force and I will try to explain that how these frictional force they vary. Now, initially this frictional force here it is typically low, then it goes up, then it goes to steady state sliding conditions. Okay. And if you see the steady state sliding conditions, there is a transition. So, transition is that it goes from low to high frictional force. Here steady state coefficient of friction mu S s is greater than that is the mu running in period. right? So, these are the four different type of frictional properties. So, it goes from very low to very high that is the type 1, then it goes to low coefficient of friction goes to little high, then goes down it is type 2 and then third one it goes to low then high and then it goes to this is type 3 and then it goes to very high then it goes to extremely high coefficient of friction is retained frictional force. So, all these different frictional force one of the thing that you must remember whenever frictional force goes to high from the low values it goes through a transition and therefore, the mechanism of friction and wear must be changing when it goes through transition at this point and also at this point. Any curve it goes through certain goes up and down, then there must be limited to or must be related to certain change in mechanisms. Okay. Now, here you will see that what I have uh, mentioned in the very beginning that how coefficient of friction they varies under different tribological conditions. So, let us say if you consider the friction in vacuum about the two matting solids the coefficient of friction can go up to very high up to 10 0.4 to 10. Okay. If you go to dry friction like classical materials and specialty materials then it goes to 0.05 to 0.8. I have shown the classical materials mean metals and alloys then it goes to up to 0 0.5 0 0.6. Some of the ceramics they will follow at the 0 0.3 0 0.4 0 0.05 it is more in the domain of polymers. Then if you go to lubricated friction like boundary lubrication, elastodynamic hydrodynamic, hydrodynamic lubrication and so on. So, this kind of lubrication I will explain to you later, but it is possible to achieve coefficient of friction mu value as low as 0 0.001. I have mentioned it to you earlier that with the help of some of the commercial lubricants and certain additives, even one can reach the coefficient of friction as small as 0 0.001. So, this is extremely good value of the coefficient of friction. So, when the coefficient of friction is 0 0.001, essentially the asperities of the two matting solids, they are not coming in physical contact with each other. So, they are kind of uh, physically more or less separated. So, that these two solids, they behave like a more or less like a frictionless surfaces. So, I think that I will stop now in this uh, in this friction and uh, friction mechanisms, laws and mechanisms. So, one of the things that I will carry forward in the next uh, in the in the uh, in the next uh, lecture that because of the continuous rubbing the friction leads to the contact temperature increase in the contact temperature. So, this contact temperature is very important because contact temperature means that although you are doing these experiments at room temperature, this, this is a ball and flat, I will use this kind of model multiple times in this course. This ball, ball is pressed against the flat by normal force N and then there is a sliding motion between these two V. So, Although this temperature is ambient temperature T A, this entire test is conducted ambient temperature, but temperature which is generated here at the contact temperature T C, it is much higher than the ambient temperature. And how high it would be it depends on the physical properties of the two solids like thermal conductivity of these solids or thermal conductivity, what is the mechanism of heat dissipation like by conduction and so on. 
but then question is this particularly this particular contact dimension is of the order of micrometer. At this small region, it is very difficult to precisely measure the contact temperature. So, therefore, certain theoretical models are there which is very useful to predict that what is the magnitude of this contact temperature at the ball and flat interfaces. And those will be the subject of discussion in the next lecture. Thank you.